What's going on, guys? My name is Joey Speaks, and this is Everyday People, the podcast. Today on the podcast, we have Ray Lewandowski. What's going on, Ray? Hey, Joey. Hey, man. Glad to have you on. Yeah, glad to be here. We've been talking about it for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like this is like deja vu. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, so Ray's been a client of mine, um, mine and Josh's for a good three, five four years. years. Five years? Yeah, it's been a while. And um, so, yeah, let's just uh, talk about how we, how we met and how we got here, where we're at right now. Yeah, um, so back in the summer of 2019, um, I was looking to start working with a trainer. Yep. Um, I knew that would be the best way for me to get back in shape. I had gained quite a bit of weight from my business and my traveling and, you know, not being focused in the gym. And I found Joey through Yelp because Yelp. I was looking for like a local Arcadia trainer somewhere close to my house that wouldn't take long to get to. Yep. And uh, had a phone call with Joey and then met him in person and we hit it off right away and yeah, yeah. Um, we started training. Uh, I think it was like June or July 2019. Yeah. Um, and then so along that way uh joey's uh been exposed to all my injuries so i came into it with a significant amount of injuries um and that was what i was looking for a trainer to to be able to maximize my workouts without further injuring my knee or my shoulder and my back yeah and it was funny like maybe six weeks into our starting to work together i went on a trip to visit my mom in florida and on the way back uh, a guy clipped my heel as I was walking through the airport and hyperextended my left leg. Uh -huh. And I partially tore my MCL. I had a torn meniscus and a strained patella tendon. And that all happened from him clipping you? Yeah, that, that just happened. Like, Because what happened is he clipped my heel and then my uh, left leg went out to stabilize me. And I, and I planted. It stuck. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it stuck. And so then I hobbled through the airport. And then I'm like, man... Because I think we we're just starting a, the first fitness challenge that I got into. Okay, yeah, yeah. And so uh, I had to train around, limp around for probably like six or eight weeks. Went on vacation to Cabo, like with a knee brace. Um, I but know, yeah, like, yeah, I remember all this. Made it, made it through that time. And then uh, was starting to train pretty consistently. And then the pandemic hit, right? And yeah, yeah. I had just uh, finished my last trip to the UK where I have a business a solar technology business yep. and we'll talk more about that later definitely um but uh so then joey was innovative and he came up with the zoom classes and uh during that time i was i was starting to get back in shape and losing some weight but my back injuries were just uh becoming unmanageable uh like if i stood more than 10 or 15 minutes my legs would go numb yeah yeah and i had a condition called uh, spondyloliosis where you're uh, vertebrae shifts forward and it was putting excessive pressure on my spine and yeah. caused me a lot of difficulties. So uh, the goal was to have surgery, a fusion and laminectomy uh, at the end of 2020. And so I started training probably like three times a week with you and Josh on Zoom. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah they'd get me ready. And so I dropped like 20 pounds and was in pretty good shape before the surgery. Um, and then the surgery was successful, did a fusion and five layer five level laminectomy where they actually take a piece of your vertebrae out in the back to make room for your spine yeah it's crazy. <laughs> i know pretty crazy it is um and you know and so and let me cut you off real fast so you know when it comes to surgery if you if you heard what ray just said he was getting ready to go into surgery the better shape that you go into surgery oh the better your outcome the after. better you're going to recover and so like you you may not know that or may not realize that that's the way that it really works is if you go in in great shape it's going to help your recovery so much where the people who kind of go in and not such great shape the recovery is just so much it's harder it hurts more like there's just so much so many worse things that can happen when you're not in good shape and so like i hope you guys heard that like he was actually training to go into surgery oh absolutely and and i had a good surgeon who actually encouraged that he goes the the lower weight you come into surgery the better the outcome is going to be because absolutely. then your rehab is going to be that much easier yep yep um I didn't hit my goal. I only got down to about 245, 250, but I still was better than the 270 I, I yeah. was at. Yeah. Um, unfortunately for me, uh, 
I had a negative outcome from the surgery due to being under anesthesia for like seven hours. It was a seven hour long surgery. That's a long surgery. Yeah. And it caused me like really bad insomnia. Like mm. I couldn't sleep and it led me to like, I didn't really focus on my uh, recovery as well as I should have because mentally I just wasn't, I wasn't fit. Yeah. Like, you know, I went through a period of about a year and a half where I was like pretty, I would say not clinically depressed, but I was definitely just doing the minimum to get by. Mm -hmm. And not only did I gain back those 20 pounds, I, I got up to almost all, all the way up to like 280. Um, and during that time, Joey and Josh were very encouraging. They're saying, you know, reached out to me to see how I was doing. I just wasn't in a, in a headspace to, to really like focus on my fitness and my mental health. And luckily my wife stood by me and I had friends and family and like friends like Joey that would reach out to me and just check out, like not to, just to encourage me, which yeah, yeah. really helped yeah, me yeah. through that. Yeah. Um, and then uh, fall of 2020, I reached back out to Joey and I said, look, I need to, I need to get back into training. Like I just have to fight through the pain. Like, yeah. you know, I haven't, I need to see if I can, if dropping 30 or 40 pounds is gonna really help my back and how I feel. And at that time, Joey's business had grown and he didn't really have any available spots. And he's like, but my son, Josh, who I actually worked with during the pandemic, yep. uh, is gonna start with the business and you could be his first client. And so that's how we started in, uh, I think August, 2020. Uh, was it 20 or 22? I'm 22. I'm sorry. You're yeah, right. Yeah, because yeah, the pandemic, yeah, the pandemic yeah, was 20. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 2020. Yeah, yeah. 2020, uh, 2022. 2022, yeah. Um, and uh, so uh, Josh is like a great young man. Like he just, I just clicked with him immediately. Yeah. Um, he's, he's just very self-aware and aware of like how you need to be trained. And he's very cognizant of that. Um, and he's just a great young man. It's just like great to talk to as a broad scope of interests. Um, music, uh, his faith, um, fitness, jujitsu. You, you know what's interesting? So, like, uh, I, I appreciate you saying all that. I'm sure he will too. But, um, you know, when he was little, <laughs> he he was four years old. Like, you can have an adult conversation with him. Like, he he just he got things at a very young age. Like, he he was very perceptive to the things around him. What was really interesting about him is that, uh, let's say, we would take him to the playground. Josh wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't just run, you know, to go start playing. He would kind of walk around and see who's who. Analyze the situation. 100%. And then when he was, when he was good, then he'd go in. And it, it's, it's a trip to, to see him at 26 years old. He's, he's exactly the same way as he was when he was a, a little guy. And so, like, it's interesting that you say all that, those things because it's literally how he was. Yeah, he's just, like, one boy. of the most even keel yeah. persons that I know. Yeah, yeah. Like, he doesn't, like, get super excited and over the top about anything, but he never gets down about anything. Yeah, yeah. And so it's, it's interesting because, you know, he's half my age, and um, we, have, we don't have different philosophies of fitness, but, you know, like, I like certain things more than he likes certain things and vice versa. And so it's cool because we kind of bounce things off each other. We do, like, I'll do his workouts, he'll do my workouts. And we, sometimes we agree on a lot of stuff. Some other times we don't agree on things, you know what I mean? And it's interesting just for, you know, he's my son, for us to have the, the, the types of opinions that we have, but we're able to kind of work together. And, you know, like, so when we talk about you, when we talk about some other clients that you know, we've both worked with or his new clients or my, my clients, um, I, I love to hear his perspective because he's a... Uh, he thinks differently than I do. Well, it says something about your dynamic and how you are as a father because he feels free to disagree with you. Yeah. Like yeah. He, he, he definitely will <laughs> state his opinion. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's funny because uh, over the last, I think like four, four or five weeks of the challenge, the challenge just ended yesterday. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I've been doing when I'm in town, when I'm not traveling, I'll do five days a, a week with Josh in the morning. And then I'll do three or four nights with the men's class, at Joey. <laughs> and I, it's like you can definitely see the different uh, style of training, right? Right. So uh, for me, Josh is perfect because he, like I say, he'll say it's like your shoulder bothering. I go, yeah. He goes because I'm more the the way I am is like I want to go hard on everything. Yeah. And he's good for me because oh, let's let's just not work on anything on your shoulder. Let's give it a rest for a few days. So he's very good at seeing, like like the whole time you're working out, he's watching to see how your form is, and he can tell whether you're weak in an area or not. 100%. So yeah. he varies the workouts in a way that, like when uh, I have friends uh, talk to me, they're like, well, you're still working with a trainer every day? And I'm like, 
Yeah, because it frees my mind. I don't have. I go in there and I don't have to think about anything. Yeah. I just have to do what he puts forth on the training schedule, and then I'm good. Yeah. And then if something's bothering me, I go. I just don't want to do that. like. What, for me, the hardest thing to do is overhead triceps. Yeah. It yeah. Just puts that like weird stress on my weird. shoulder. Yeah, yeah. And I just like I, you know. The funny thing is, is that's the reason why it's such a good tricep. Oh yeah. Uh, um, exercise because you're in that position, but it sucks for if you have a bad shoulder though. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm 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 sad and I'm glad that the challenge is over. Yeah. <clears throat> Cuz like last night I got to eat a bunch of carbs <laughs> and I felt really happy and actually slept really good. I think moving forward I'm not going to be so strict cuz I I kind of went like 65% protein on my diet mm -hmm. and uh, I wasn't I the nights that I would eat some carbs I worked out much better the next day. So sure. I think yeah. it's a, a journey, right? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like figure out how your body works. 100%. One thing I do know is that uh, processed foods, uh, sugar, um, alcohol are all negative for me. And in general, they're bad for anybody who has inflammation issues. Absolutely. Like well, I have arthritis yeah. in every joint. Mm -hmm. So like if I get any inflammation, like I'm like an old crotchety man walking down the steps the next day it makes it tough it makes it tough and so uh so ray's mentioned the challenge a couple times uh, my transformation challenge number 14 just ended um just yesterday yep. yeah i just ended yesterday and so uh it's cool because you know like a lot of my clients a lot of you know our clients are in the challenge but then there's some other people who are not in the, um our clients who are in the challenge also and it's cool to watch you guys kind of hit a switch where like you know you're training and like it's it's like you're it's what you do all the time, but then and all of a sudden we have a little bit of a competition and you kick it up a notch. And I think that there is, don't get me wrong, some people are super competitive and they're always like that. Most of the time people are not like that all the time, but it's cool for me to watch you guys say, okay, it's go time. And you know, like oh, for the next eight weeks, like I'm doing this, 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 and this. Because you know, like to be in challenge mode all year long is not realistic, yeah. unless, unless bodybuilding is your job. And you know we all have we all have other jobs as opposed to just you know so it's cool to watch you guys kind of kick it uh, kick it up a notch and uh, it, it's interesting to watch you guys work out and um, together you know it, it's it's a cool dynamic yeah it's, and I uh, think for me one of the most rewarding parts of doing the challenges is like I'm very competitive as, as my nature like in being an entrepreneur you have to be competitive yeah yeah um, but I think the the biggest thing I get out of it is seeing people who aren't who haven't been like into fitness like i've been in i've been a gym rat since i was like 16 years old yeah. it's where i find my mental clarity like it's my way to release my brain from thinking about all the other things in life right but i still have gone through like the ups and downs of gaining weight losing weight i still have the struggles that people who aren't into fitness because the reality is is fitness is for your body like mechanical function mm -hmm. right for working out yep. and like bone density and as you get older it's all very important but like diet is probably 80 percent of the game absolutely it's like absolutely if, if you're putting in clean healthy foods into your body and you're in like at your metabolic need for calories are a little bit below you don't really need to do crazy workouts you could just walk and do calisthenics and be fine yeah right yeah that's it's one of the things that i learned and so i like to see people that you could tell haven't been fitness fanatics their whole life and they enter the challenge and you see that switch yeah yeah click right it, it flips and they make the biggest transformations because it's like the first time they've gotten that euphoria of seeing change right. like that Right. Uh, it, it's called a, uh, uh, well, the, I guess the ghetto phrase. I don't know what phrase it's called, but like, it's kind of like newbie gains. Like when, uh, oh yeah, when, exactly. When you, have, yeah, no, when you exactly. have not done, when you have not trained, your body is like, it's brand new to it. Like it's something that's so brand new to your body. It's like, oh, I love this. And it will immediately react and you'll get the best results when you first start off. And then the longer that you go, the harder it is to maintain what you've done. And so when people who have not trained or have not done anything seriously with, with, uh, with their body, when they start, man, like it's cool to watch them physically do it, but then you can tell when it mentally hits them from the physical part of it. Yeah. And I, I, I think I went through that because, uh, when I started back training like, uh, August, 2022 until like maybe March, April, 2023, I was getting in shape, but I wasn't losing any weight mm -hmm. because I wasn't following the meal plan that, Josh put together for me like I was still just like 
and you know I was still having drinks and like eating carbs whenever I wanted I wasn't being consistent in my diet and I was using the excuse that I was busy traveling again right and then I remember clearly uh, my turning point is I do work at National Renewable Energy Laboratory outside of Denver okay. and so it's at high elevation right yeah, 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 yeah. it's like over 5,000 foot elevation and the NREL government facility is like a college campus. It's all on this hill and you walk everywhere. Okay. And so it's at high elevation and I'm at 280 pounds and I had to like, there was no uh, courtesy bus to take me up to this building. I had to go to a meeting. It was like maybe only like a quarter mile or a third of a mile walk, but it was up this hill. Yeah, yeah. And I got to the top and I was drenched in sweat. I had to go into a meeting and I was like out of breath. So I barely made it to the meeting. I'm out of breath. And they're like, are you okay? Like, you, do you want to like stop and wait? Till? And I just felt so embarrassed, mm. right? That I was in this physical shape that mm. I couldn't like walk a quarter mile up a hill without like being like totally fatigued. And, and I knew it wasn't, I, w I was strong. It was because I was, I was 280, yeah, yeah. right? And so right then and there, I said like, no alcohol, no sugar. And I just went like, I just followed like the calorie plan that Josh put together and what it was like four or five months i dropped like 60 pounds yeah maybe. right it was like as soon as i started following a, a consistent diet plan and it wasn't super restrictive i was still doing 16 1800 calories a day um it was because i was consistent and i was right macros like yeah. i wasn't having you know i was having vegetables and rice and protein but you know that was the the turning point for me and that's where josh was really good because he like you know, he'd be very encouraging. As soon as you start following the diet plan, you're going to see results. Yeah. He yeah. goes, it's just science, man. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's uh, in my experience as a trainer and as a guy who's been working out and, you know, being an athlete. There are things that you just can't get around. And I think that people try to, aside from what you're talking about right now, I think people, they want it to be the way that they want it to be. And, you know, the funny thing is, is that, you know, like most people love to work out. Once they come into the gym, like that, you like throwing weights around. You, it, it's the physical part is fun. It's it's the part when you're not in the gym and you have to make sure that you're eating the right things consistently. And I've always I've always had a lot of empathy and sympathy because I've been in the same position myself. Um, where when I was when I was fat, I was 248 pounds, and I had to get my act together. Um, but you, not 280. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, We've all been in our places. Hey, I'm proud of the fact that I was able to drop from 280 to 220. Yeah, in. man. Yeah, man. It's, it's awesome. And the biggest thing for me is that, so I got to 220, I think, like September of last year, and I've been able to maintain it. And I think I've actually changed my body structure while I've maintained it. 100%. 100%. It's, it's the decisions that you have to make consistently when no one's around. And that's when, you know, like, you know, the phrase that we've all probably heard, oh, I'm a grown ass man, or like, like I'm, I'm an adult, I can, I can take care of myself and I can, well, the reality is, is that when no one else is looking, most people do what they wanna do, not what they should do, especially when it comes to food. And the, I think the thing that makes it hardest and the thing I have the most empathy for is that like, you have to do it every single day, three, four, five, six times a day. And until you are, until you have a, a moment like you had in Denver, yeah. until someone has a moment whether it's in the doctor's office or wherever it may be. It's your bottom where you're like, I'm done. Once you get to that point, your mind will change. And then your body will change. And your mind changed that day. Oh, yeah. And so, like, you know, it's, until you get to that point, it's a very hard decision to make those three, four, five, six times a day because you don't want to do it. And, you know, like, that, that's a part of discipline, doing stuff that you don't want to do but acting like you want to do it and just doing it. And so it's, it's, a, it's a very hard thing to do. Um, so I, I don't, whenever someone does what you've done or any kind of fitness journey, like I respect what people do because I know how hard it is. And I know how, I know where everyone was at in their own individual journey to start and then to get where you're at. I know what it takes. And so like I, I'm, um, I respect it because I know how hard it is. Yeah, and, and I, I always tell my wife, it's so much easier for me. Like I travel like probably two weeks a month now because I have a, a solar technology business that we'll talk more about later. But like I'm in Austin, Texas, like Monday through Friday, twice a month. Yeah, yeah. And I always stay at a hotel that's away from any restaurants, right? That just has like the most basic gym. It's got like a dumbbell rack and two working cardio machines. Mm -hmm. And 
I go to work in the lab at the University of Texas, and then I come back and I work out, and I, I like take like six or eight eggs from the breakfast platter in the morning, <clears throat> and then I'll just eat the egg whites at night. Nice. Or if I do have barbecue, I'll just order it from a local place, and I'll just get meat, right? So I can be so disciplined because there's not like eight different bags of chips flavors and candy everywhere that we yeah. have at our house yeah yeah that's yeah. the hardest thing <clears throat> excuse me for me at night like after, after i finish my work whatever i mean, had dinner and i'm watching television that's when i want a snack right yeah, yeah, yeah. and like having some type of healthy alternative always is like like you you can't always say i'm not going to eat anything all the time like i'm just going to eat my 15 or 1800 calories and that's it there's going to be like I, my wife has a big Mexican family, and there's a birthday, a baby's birthday, an event, an anniversary Something every going weekend, all the time. Yeah, yeah. right? And so I would basically be stuck eating salad at those events, yeah, yeah. right? So I just have to learn how to like moderate how much intake I have. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so, in your particular case, uh, so everything that we've been talking about now, so you've been your highest has been 280, and you're hovering around 220 right yep. now. So that's, I mean, like I said, that's awesome. Now. On top of losing that much weight and getting stronger and developing muscle, all the things that you've done, you've done this with the injuries that you've had. So yeah. we've already talked about your surgery uh, on your spine, um, but like, so you have a you have a shoulder, you have a knee, you have a spine. Uh, so like, I, I know you were telling me about an accident you had a, a while back. Oh yeah, so, well, so like how did that uh, start? I I was an avid motorcycle rider from the time I was like 15 years old, so. After I graduated college and through college, uh, I rode my motorcycle anytime I could. When it okay. wasn't raining or snowing or something, wherever I lived. Like I, a Harley or like a, like uh, a, no, like a cross uh, rocket? No, a Ninja. A Ninja 900. That was okay. the last bike that I had. Okay. Uh, so it was a, you know, a Japanese racing motorcycle, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, when I was 25, I was working at a medical device company in Miami. And it was a Saturday. I went into work to finish up some projects because I was going to be gone on vacation for a week to Jamaica. And so I dro drove down to work foolishly in flip-flops, uh, shorts, and a T-shirt. And, of Ooh. course, my racing helmet. Yeah. That, that ended up saving my life. But, like, on the way home, I'm just driving. Usually I would drive very aggressively. But the thing I thought about driving aggressively was that I was always aware of everything. When you're driving fast and aggressive, you're watching every car, every right. rear view mirror, everything. And this time I'm like, I'm not gonna even take a chance. I'm just going the speed limit, just kicking back. But I wasn't aware and I got center punched by uh, a Cadillac Eldorado with like, like an 80 year old lady driver who didn't see me because she was turning in to go to a Denny's. That's what she told the police, right? And okay. Center punched me. I was going about 55 miles an hour. What does center punch mean? Like, uh, hit, like T-bone me. Like okay. she came from the side. Hit you right in the middle. Yeah. Got you. Okay. And uh, launched me into oncoming traffic. Like I flew, I think it was like 75, 80 feet. And yeah. In the air? In the air. And then I landed and an oncoming car like ran over the, like the tip of my helmet, cracked my helmet. Um, and then like all of a sudden I'm on the ground and my legs pointing the wrong way and my kneecap was like torn off mm. and bones are sticking out of my leg and I'm, I don't feel any pain. I'm just in like total shock and all these people are like, oh, we've called the, the police and the ambulance coming. Luckily the ambulance came in like three or four minutes and the, I remember the paramedic going, oh man, well, you're gonna be okay. I'm like, dude, that's not okay, <laughs> man. I can see. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? <laughs> yeah. Uh, long story short, like in the hospital for like six weeks, multiple surgeries, had a great surgeon, put me back together, like six months in a brace and a cast, uh, dropped, went from like 100, 190 pounds really fit to like 155 pounds, wow. like skin and bones because I didn't want to eat because I couldn't work out, yeah, yeah. right? So unfortunately, I still like to drink. So I was still drinking beer, mm -hmm. right? So it was on that like carbohydrate beer diet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, not healthy, but uh, luckily had a good physical therapist, um, got back you know, into the gym and working out, but my right leg was like quarter inch shorter than my left leg after all the surgeries and everything. Did you I also get a spine injury with the accent or was it both uh, just your leg? There was no, 
spine injury uh, identified, but I'm sure that that impact had, had something some. To do with it, yeah. But the biggest impact, that even, and even in physical therapy, the guy goes, you're going to want to wear a quarter inch lift in your shoe because if you don't, your walking gait is going to be off and it's going to cause right. you spine problems. And I'm like, I'm, that's weird. I'm not putting like every shoe I have put a quarter inch lift in there. Yeah, yeah. I tried it for a while and then I, like I stopped doing it. Well, eventually that like ended up being a big cause of my, my spine issues oh. because it, it shifted how I walked and it put different stress on it. Yeah. Plus like, you know, throughout my, before that I would played uh, rugby for like three years in college and you know, you just get beat up in rugby. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Shoulder injuries, knee injuries, all these things. And you tough it out, right? You take some ibuprofen and put a band aid on it and you still and play. Yeah. Um, and then in my twenties and thirties and forties, I played, uh, racquetball and handball on hardwood courts and on concrete. Okay. And that probably didn't help me at all. And then concrete does not forgive. It wasn't until I was in my late forties, um, in 2000, nine or 2005 that I started doing martial arts okay um I was in pretty good shape I was about 190 200 at the time uh working out all the time working with a trainer at world's gym in San Diego and I just wanted to diversify my training okay and then got addicted to I went to a kung fu school that also had like grappling and striking classes and for from 2005 through 2009 or 2005 through 2010 those five years I trained like four or five days a week at the studio, got really into grappling and striking, and then didn't want to do Kung Fu anymore. Didn't want to like do all the weapons training and all yeah, the yeah, yeah. 10,000 different forms. I got out to like a purple sash, like two, two steps away from my uh, black sash. Okay. Um, but I found that that training wasn't for me. Like it was more about having a passion for Kung Fu as an art form, like learning all the long form swords and battle axes. And I just, all I wanted to do was spar and grapple because that was the fun part you like to mix it up a little yeah. bit yeah yeah, yeah. and uh <laughs> foolishly got talked into doing some like uh full contact competitions found that i didn't like getting punched like that i just i just didn't have that mentality where that made me happier to be in there it, it made me more like yeah this is maybe i'm an engineer and entrepreneur i need my brain to to make money maybe this isn't the yeah. best thing for me it, yeah. especially i was closing in on 50 um at oh, the wow. time when i was doing it uh, but I did enjoy doing the grappling tournaments. But at that time, uh, right before I started training, I had a ruptured, uh, a herniated disc. And I never got, like, the proper physical therapy for it. And then... And that's, a, that's such a... The, the proper rehab for any injury, especially a serious injury like that, is such... It's, it's probably the most important thing you can do. Because if you don't heal it correctly... It, it will heal incorrectly, and then you'll always have more injuries from that. Yeah, and I, and I could say that I I did not like. I went to an orthopedic surgeon, and he's like, "Look, we should we should uh, probably do a fusion on you right now, mm. right?" And I'm like, "That seems drastic." And I was like, "I'm going to try the therapy route." And I got a chiropractor, and then I got I did like decompression therapy, and uh, for me, it didn't really work that well, yeah. right? And then, um, you know what, you know what, l let's take a quick little break. Okay. And we'll come right back. We'll pick right back up. Where okay. We're at. Sounds okay? good. All right. We'll be right back guys. What was the last thing you were saying? Oh, we're picking up on the, where I get injured doing oral. I don't know if my injuries came from martial arts, but martial arts definitely exacerbated my, so in 2007, I got diagnosed with a herniated disc. It was a pretty severe herniation, but, uh, uh, I, I noticed it because uh, I started limping and on my right leg, I lost nerve connection to my calf. Mm. So it was causing me not to be able to like toe walk. Uh, so oh, hip, you couldn't roll? I, I couldn't go up on my toes Got it. on my right leg. Anyway, so that led me to like, well, my back always kind of had like pain. It was from like the, you know, the issues from my motorcycle accident. And so I just always dealt with it, right? Just like stretch and, and you know, take ibuprofen, whatever. Um, and then when I got my MRI and the surgeon said, like, well, we should probably do a fusion that will stabilize your spine. I'm like, that's too crazy. I'm not going to do that. Went into rehab. The rehab helped the pain and let me continue to do martial arts and train. But all I was doing was re-aggravating it. But you didn't fix it. Yeah. And so finally, I, I and because I couldn't do my other like weight training and cardio because I couldn't run or yeah, like yeah. and everything was painful. I got back up to like 260. Like, you know, I just gained my, 
I'm, I'm Polish and Croatian, so if I see carbohydrates, I can gain weight just by looking at it. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> my body thinks that I'm in Northern Europe and I need to store fat for the winter, even though I live in Southern California. <laughs> so um, then it was like uh, I just had to stop training in martial arts. Like that was uh, at the end of 2010. And then um, my chiropractor recommended that I go into CrossFit, which he wasn't a very good chiropractor to recommend a <laughs> 52 year old overweight dude with like back issues to go into CrossFit. Yeah, yeah. Because the, the second week into the training, I blew another disc doing this crazy Olympic lifting the guy had me doing. Yeah. And then that was like uh, an, another year and a half of like pain and agony because at the time I was living in San Diego and working at a, as a VP general manager for a nano and micro embossing company in LA. Mm -hmm. So I was doing 200 miles a day round trip commute. That's right. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that. I did that for six years because my daughter was in high school. At the you time. did that every day for six years? Four, four days a week minimum. And uh, then uh, in, at the end of, at the beginning of 2012, I found a chiropractor in San Diego and I met with him and he's like, look, if you follow this diet plan I give you, you're going to drop 50 pounds. And he goes, we're going to do these series of treatments, but you got to come three days a week. Yep. And it was like hundred dollars a treatment. Right. But I figured I don't care if it's 1500 or 2000 a month, if this guy can help me, I'm going to try it. Yep. So he did specialized decompression tr uh, treatments on me red light laser therapy, uh, massage therapy. But the key thing was, he goes, all that's only going to work if you drop 50 pounds. Right. Right. He goes, you, that 50 pounds is causing thousands of pounds of stress on your spine when you walk. Right. And, and like sitting in a car, you're still compressing your spine with all that extra weight around yeah. your belly. Yeah. So uh, it was this extreme program called uh, Ideal Protein. So it was like 1,200 calories a day. You had to eat like six 150 to 200 calorie meals a day oh, wow. in a very sequenced pattern, no alcohol, you know, two liters of water a day. But I did, I dropped like 60 pounds in like six months. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then with all that treatment, my back started feeling better. Right. And then uh, I, I maintained that weight loss all the way through uh, 2013. But I made the decision to start my solar technology company in the beginning of 2013. Okay. And that started me traveling like. So the first year, uh, it was a disruptive technology that all it was was a couple little prototypes on microscope slides because I'd met the inventor at a trade show in 2011 and had been percolating the idea in my head for the next year and a half, two years. And it came time where we had the opportunity to move forward with the project and I could consult to make money. So what I did is I worked a year for free and that got me 20% uh, of the of the company Got it. that was like my sweat equity so 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 what exactly like what's your job title and i know you're not you're an entrepreneur but like just kind of catch us up from the very beginning of you know what your title is and what you do and so like my background's in chemical engineering yep. i made my bones uh being a process optimization expert i've worked in uh lithium power sources for pacemakers uh, in the medical device industry uh specialty coatings for ophthalmic wear for lens uh, glassware uh, scratch resistant coatings, anti-reflective coatings, um, worked in the lithium ion and nickel cadmium rechargeable battery industry, uh, always as a, a process engineer or operations manager, uh, optimizing yields for very technical processes. Okay. Um, and so every job that I took, I took because of the interest in that field. Like I always wanted to learn new new fields, and in uh, the end of uh, the '80s, I had the opportunity to move to California with a company I was working with in uh, Virginia. Mm -hmm. I was an ophthalmic lens company, and then uh, was able to get into the energy industry through Pacific Gas and Electric. Okay, I was working at their geothermal power plants um, as a chemical. These are big words, man. <laughs> so basically, just taking nasty steam out of the. Uh, steam fields in Northern California. There's a region where there's uh, a geological activity and the, the earth's heat is coming close to the surface and it creates 
and the rock formation is proper where it can create steam and trap steam, yeah. you can pull that steam and that energy and run turbine generators for power. Okay. So the, at the Geysers uh, geothermal facility in uh, Northern California, they, they generate close to a thousand megawatts of power from all the different geothermal fields and there's little 100 to 150 megawatt power plants dotted all over the Mayacamas Mountains in Northern Sonoma County. Okay. So it was a great job. I got to drive through the uh, wine country every day to work. Um, got to go to work in shorts and a t-shirt because you had to wear like your full like coveralls and hard hats and metatarsal oh, yeah. boots when you're on the facility. Yeah, yeah. But I got my start in uh, the renewables energy industry there and then worked for Pacific Gas and Electric for a couple years and then was able to become a consultant for other power plants run by other organizations in that area through like 2000, I mean, uh, 1996. Now, when you grew up, did you want to be a chemical engineer? Like what you got, what got you into being I, a chemical engineer? I remember engineer? I talked to you about this before. Like when yeah. I was in ninth grade, we had like a, a <clears throat> seminar and they, these different like scientists, mathematicians, engineers, uh, you know, writers came in and talk about what they did, yeah, yeah. right? And there was a, a chemical engineer came and talked about what his job was. And he was working in the oil and gas industry. And he's like, I just get to help the company make more money based on what they already do, you know? And it just clicked with me, it made sense. And he went into more detail about what it means sure, to sure. like optimize a process and understand, you know, all the uh, engineering and chemistry that goes along with oil and gas industry. but. In ninth grade, I knew like I want to be a chemical engineer, and that was like it. I never, I never changed. That's cool. And so I applied to the best chemical engineering schools in the in the Northeast because my parents were like, "You're not staying with your friends here in South Florida. You're not. You'll be a ten year like junior." You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. and, and they were right. All my buddies yeah, yeah, that yeah. went to school at University of Miami or uh, Florida Atlantic or you know uh, Florida State. They ended up being like six or seven year, like before Juniors. graduation, because it. it was too much fun down there. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, were you, were you always smart, or did did you have to work really hard, or were you like naturally gifted? You know, unfortunately you know, for me in high school, everything came really easy. Like mm -hmm. I understood calculus, I understood physics and math. Like uh, I always had an interest in reading, so I I didn't read just fiction. I read a lot of you know. Uh, I read books about organic chemistry. I read books about history. Because you liked it. I liked it. I liked to read and understand things. And I had a natural uh, ability to understand problem solving, right? Okay. Um, so it, it came easy to me, but what I didn't realize, and I think it, it's a corollary to like athletes, like when you're uh, the big fish in a little pond, like you're, you're the star athlete in a small town, mm -hmm. and then you go to a, a, a major college or even a mid-level college, then there's everybody there is that person, mm -hmm. right? So now you're in a big, a different competition pool. And that's what I realized when I went to University of Pittsburgh and mm -hmm. they had a really good chemical engineering program. But my freshman year, I realized, oh crap, I'm gonna have to study. I'm gonna have to really read and, and study before tests. I just can't go in there and wing right, it right. on my own. But it was a good experience because it let me realize that I can enjoy that hard work. Mm -hmm. I can enjoy the, the preparation and what it takes. And I think that's why I'm a successful entrepreneur is that it's not easy, right? And you're, and you're gonna fail more than you succeed. Sure. But as long as you learn from every in, little failure and, and improve a little bit on your next progression, you're gonna you're gonna be fine. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing with I think any advice I give because I I work with the PhD students at the University of Texas. They work on projects for me. Okay. Um, and I like being a mentor to them because what I tell them is like, all it takes is the grind, right? You're 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 intelligent. We know you're intelligent. Wouldn't be a PhD student if right. if you weren't you know if you weren't intelligent. How what the difference is going to be and how successful you are in your career is the effort that you put forth grinding day in and day out and trying to be better, right? And then also giving yourself forgiveness if you don't hit your targets. Yeah, yeah. Like, you should hit targets that are almost unattainable, right? Because if you get 70% of the way, you're still ahead of the pack. Sure, yeah, yeah. So, uh, that was like the, you know, kind of the progression of how my career and all the, the little stops and changes that I made in my career that led me to know that I didn't want to have a boss. Right, and if you don't yeah, want to have a boss, then you got to do your own thing, like you do. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. and that's it's a whole different. Yeah, yeah, it's much different than 
just being an employee. Yeah, for it's, sure. It's like you have all the responsibility, right? The outcomes are based on your performance, uh, but then you don't have anybody giving you direction that you don't agree with. Yeah, and that's what I found. Eventually, no matter how far I got up, I got to be like you know a general manager, or a vice president of a very innovative firm in LA, and grew them from like five million a year to like over fifteen million a year in revenues. Um, but I still could not get over the irritation I got when the owners of the company wouldn't listen to my advice yeah, yeah. when it seemed like so logical to me. And so I don't know why I let it bother me, but it, it caused me mental turmoil that they would not take my advice on how to improve things for not only them, but all the, all of our employees. Cause we got up to about 80 employees. So I felt uh, a certain responsibility to the employees to make sure that they had a long-term future at the company right, yeah. and could get like, substantial increases in pay because when I got there they were woefully underpaid for what it costs to live in Southern California mm. right it's like <laughs> yeah. you, you know uh, when you say uh, when when McDonald's was paying more than what we were paying someone to start working as an operator then that was a problem well, like huh? there we're talking having somebody run rotating equipment at high speed and has to like know what they're doing and be on top of it eight hours of their shift, less money than it takes someone to like push a cash register and flip a burger, there's something wrong with that. Yeah. Right, but uh, credit to the owners, they uh, understood that and let me like increase the, at least to the working value where, okay, uh, for example, if somebody's making like say 20 bucks an hour and you give them a 10% raise, two bucks an hour really isn't going to change their outcome of their life. You're asking them to give up more of their life to be a, a more important person in your organization. Give them something where they can have a better car or, or a better apartment to live in. Just a better quality of life. Better quality of life. Yeah, yeah. Then they're going to they're gonna take ownership in the company and really bust their ass. 100%. The best job I ever had, I worked at Yahoo Search Marketing. What's up, guys, from Yahoo? <laughs> um, they treated us so good that once a month, maybe twice a month, I would go in on a Saturday, whenever I wanted to, because I worked Monday through Friday. I would go in, do three, four hours of just kind of catching up, getting all my stuff tight, because they treated us so good. <coughs> they treated us so good that like I was happy to give them my time. I was happy to work overtime. I was happy to do whatever they needed me to do, because they treated us so good. They literally would have like all hands meetings or department meetings, <coughs> and they would ask us our opinions. And they would actually use the good opinions that people had. But to me, that's just smart management. Yeah, but it doesn't happen everywhere. No. The, the, the smart places implement it. May, everyone may do it, but everyone doesn't implement it. And I've had this, I've had the, you know, the, the process be where that's the way the organization starts. And then they get some success and they think yeah, yeah. we need to be more corporate. And we need to like yeah, yeah. keep track of everything better and like cut costs. And, and I'm like, why aren't you doing what you you did to make yourself successful, yeah. right? Um, the the same thing is happening with the, my, my corporation. So where am I at today? So in 2013, I made the jump to, to start, uh, at that time it was called Big Solar. Okay. Um, uh, and and that's standard for built-in groove. Because what we do is we take a standard architecture photovoltaic panel, like the kind of panels you put on your roof for uh -huh. uh, solar uh, capturing technology. Um, those are all like uh, flat, linear, thick glass uh, substrates, right? Very heavy, known performance for decades, like beneficial. The whole world should have as many panels as, they, as it can be. Like just every surface on the planet should be able to capture the energy from the sun. It would just make everything better. Yeah. Um, our technology, we, Brit, we take uh, micro groove technology and, and enhance it uh, the process so that you can manufacture solar panels on very thin film like you know maybe like you know the thickness of a, a thick garbage bag that oh. thin and that that film can then be processed manufactured roll to roll so hence the name of the company now is power roll so big solar was the start built in groove um, and but our product was power roll mm -hmm. and now the company transitioned to now we're power roll limited and we're based out of Durham County in the uh, north of England. Okay, is, is this the um, the place that you were you were talking? You were telling me something about like where uh, 
you could put one of these panels like in the street where it would be able to capture energy from the cars rolling. Oh, over that's a that's like a that. that's a new technology that some of my uh, original partners and I are looking into, and that's called the uh, kinetic pad. So um, there's there's tons of ways to capture energy. Um, you can capture energy like uh, through friction. Okay. Like there's a company that my my wife's company started a number of years ago uh, called Energy Vault. And what they do is during the daytime when there's excess renewable energy, right, <clears throat> that's not being stored. It's like if you don't use it, you lose it, okay. right, during the daytime. Kind of like, mus um, like muscle? <clears throat> uh, and they use it to uh, use cranes to lift these giant blocks of cement up into these structures that at night the cement slowly comes down through gravity and that friction force that's being developed is turned into electrical engine en energy. Is it kind of like a, like the hybrid brakes, like where when you're pushing the exactly. brake, it creates the same, energy in the, the battery? Exactly, the same philosophy. Okay. Right? It's taking that friction energy and converting it back into stored energy. Okay. Um, so, uh, our technology, um, the power roll technology has a lot of benefits for military aspects where right now, if say the military has a campaign in the desert, they have to bring out diesel generators to power their mm. grids, all their power sources, everything else, their, their camps. Whereas with power roll technology, they could just unroll a roll of solar power out in the desert and, and clip in wow. and have power right there. So it's the future. It's the future. Um, ours is just one of, of the new technologies that's gonna change the, the face of the global energy picture. Mm. Um, what people don't realize is that we need to come up with new energy storage technologies because Lithium batteries are not the answer, okay. right? There's uh, material constraints. There's the, the cost of lithium itself, but there's also a more critical path is the cobalt used for the anode material in the batteries. Okay. And that cobalt, 80% of it is mined in the Congo. And a high percentage of those mines aren't high-tech industrial mines. They're open pit mines where you're having, you know, uh, children hand mining cobalt and like they'll be lucky to live into their 30s because of all the other toxic i mean whenever you mine there's toxicity there's arsenic mercury right. all these different materials that can kill you so that's why i don't believe in the present strategy we have that we're just going to keep making more lithium batteries right because lithium batteries also have an end of life yeah, yeah. right and then what are we going to do with all that material that can't be recycled there is new technologies coming out on focused on recycling the batteries to capture all the materials and not put such toxicity back into the okay. into landfills. However, they're not perform. There, it costs more to extract the materials than they're worth, and Got so okay. uh, they're more <clears throat> future hopefulness and altruistic uh, reasons behind doing that. Okay, but anyway, um, the way things are going right now, we've been doing power roll for 12 years now and we've gotten consistent uh, private funding we have like 60 employees in in a facility in the north of england we have small format manufacturing where we can uh, manufacture rolls of material six inches wide and you know hundreds of meters long to make our mini panels okay and that is going to be expanded to meter wide capacity sometime in the next year uh, once we hit our performance targets uh, which looks like we're on track to do. It'll kick off like a 60 million pound project in the north of England to build oh, wow. our, our first production facility. So now what you do in England, um, is it the same Is it the same thing that you're doing in Texas or are they two different things? No, it's, it's so, so they're the same and they're different. So uh, I am uh, one of the founders of Power Roll. Um, in, in England. In England. Yep. Um, but as I'm not gonna move to England, I've never been an employee. I've always just been a consultant to Powerwall through my uh, my design corporation. I have a design okay. corporation since 2003 in California called Cameratech Design. Okay. And that's where I run all my consulting business. So uh, along the path of doing Powerwall to subsidize my income, so I wasn't taking too much money out of the startup, I was still consulting doing different engineering projects in the Got it. security industry, the pigment industry, design industry. So, and I still uh, am open to do that. And we'll, you know, uh, 
if my wife had her way, I'd be doing more of that to <laughs> generate more income. <laughs> but, uh, you know, right now my focus is going to be, so like your question, again, going back to your question about is what I do in, in Texas the same as what we do in England? Yes and no. We're using the same architecture, but we don't we just want to duplicate what we're doing in England. We want to be more innovative and come up with strategies and new material sets and new design sets that improve the, the technology. Got it. And then that could be ubiquitously deployed, right? Because one of the, one of the uh, business <clears throat> uh, uh, like projections that we have, like one of the potential outcomes that we see moving forward is that we design a gigafactory, which is making like a gigawatt of power every year. Okay. Um, uh, it's like factory in a box. Everything's designed. And we have all the IP, they have, we have like 80 world patents uh, submitted and accepted. Um, so we have IP protection, we have a facility design, you just pay us a fee for the technology and then give us royalties on production. And then we help you build that wherever you want in the world. That's the beauty of this process. It's all well-known roll-to-roll uh, processing that's used in like the printing industry and the packaging industry. It's low cost, it's high speed, uh, it's safe. Uh, and it produces rolls of power, right? So that's the goal, not have one giant factory that supplies the world, have small factory in a box, you know, facilities located close to where you're gonna deploy the technology. And you can kind of move them anywhere. Yep. Well, They're very small footprint um, compared to like silicon uh, panel fab. Okay, it definitely sounds like the future, that's for sure. There's gonna be something like, if it's not power roll that succeeds in this sector, there's other companies doing low cost, flexible solar technology. Out Got there, it. Right? And you, actually, as an entrepreneur and a, and a new business uh, inventor, you wanna be in markets where there's competition, right? Very rarely are you gonna be the only solution out there. There's, a, there's, sure, sure, there's sure. not too many like uh, Facebook stories out there where okay. you're the first one in the market and you have no competition. Got it. So, um is there, uh, what's the name of your company? Is there any way that you w would want people to contact you? Because I'm, I'm going to leave the information in the uh, in the description of the video also. Yeah, if anybody's interested in our technology, yeah, yeah. it's uh, powerroll.solar, P-O-W-E-R-R-O-L-L dot S-O-L-A-R. Okay. Powerroll.solar. And that gives an, a description of, of what we're trying to do. Okay. And then I have my own uh, design company, Camara Tech Design, um, but I don't have a website, but you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, oh, yeah. under my name, Ray Lewandowski, and it gives it a background of everything that I've done. Okay. Is that the easiest way for them to reach you? Yeah. LinkedIn is be a good way to reach me if you're interested in connecting. Okay. So, uh, very interesting, man. Very interesting. Uh, is there anything else you want to talk about before we wrap no, up? No, I just or? want to reiterate that um, anybody who listens to this uh, podcast and is interested in like making a significant change in their life should look into hiring Joey and Joss as their trainers. Thank you. There's like, they offer... Uh, women's and men's group classes, personal training, Zoom training. They, it's like a one-stop shop. And these guys are perfect to work with, especially if you have any injuries you want to work around um, and just want to work with some really great people. Thank you, Ray. I appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, brother. Thank you, man. You changed my life. I appreciate it. That makes me feel good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, guys, this has been a great hour. Um, very interesting guy. I, I knew this. I wanted to make sure that everybody else can see this. And, uh, you know, as physical as you are, and I know all the injuries you've had and all the things you've been through, to do what you've done is, is awesome. So I'm, I'm happy to be working with you. I'm happy that we've gotten to be friends, hung out, watched some UFC fights yeah. and stuff like that, you know. Um, but it we really is more of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it really is interesting to really, uh, you know, when I first met Ray, he would tell me about his job and the things he would do. And he would talk and I would just kind of just get dizzy. And I'm like, oh, I'm not sure what the hell you're talking about. But it's just interesting when you're able to articulate it into like layman's terms and make me understand it, make us understand it. It's, it's really cool. So I hope you guys enjoy this hour, guys. Take care. You guys have a good one. See you in the next video.